How exactly does the Twitter files investigation work? The Golden Globes ruin Eddie Murphy's joke. And and what should come as no surprise to anyone, a Pfizer board member tried to silence speech on Twitter. This is the Propaganda Report's Drive Time at News Blast. I am Brad Binkley. Happy Thursday. I've been a little under the weather this week, which is why I haven't been able to get a show up until today. I'm feeling pretty much better, but... I have a lot of material, so I'm not going to cram it all into this show. I will post another show later this evening, one tomorrow, and most likely one over the weekend as well. Okay, so another Twitter Files report was dropped yesterday. This one from a former New York Times writer and the dude who successfully sued his way back onto Twitter after getting permanently suspended. That is Alex Berenson. He was suspended permanently from Twitter in 2021 before he sued them, ultimately getting Twitter to agree to a settlement, allowing him back on the platform. Before doing a quick overview of his Twitter thread, he also published an article a couple of days ago on his Substack about his involvement in the Twitter files that gives some insight into how all of this is working, this Twitter files investigation, or at least how they want us to believe that it's working anyway. And I found it kind of interesting. Here's what he said. Ten days ago, he was invited, so that's going to be at the end of 2022, to look over the COVID-related documents at Twitter's headquarters in San Francisco. The Twitter files are not separate from all of the other databases. They're within all of the databases, so they have to kind of, you know, weed through all of them, which means that what Musk is really offering him and the other writers is the chance to search Twitter's vast systems seeking information about specific topics, which Berenson says is a process akin to Discovery in civil lawsuits. Reporters ask for searches. Twitter turns over what it finds to be read or screenshotted there at the headquarters. And then the reporters can go report their findings based on what they discovered. Speaking about the COVID-related files, he says that it's going to take time because to get through all of them because Twitter's databases are huge and that searching them is complex and that the email and Slack databases are held off-site and searchers must tailor their request very specifically because of the volume of the data they contain, as well as because of the potential to reveal personal information. There's a scene in X-Files where the smoking man, spoiler, if you haven't seen it yet, first came out in 93, goes and takes some evidence that Mulder Scully had, I can't remember who, into this giant, vast evidence room, data room. He opens the doors in the Pentagon, and it's just walls, endless walls of information about people. And I'm imagining something like that, except more modernized, times like 100 or 1,000. Probably no one person can get through all of this data in a lifetime. What I think this means is that we're going to be getting a drip, drip, drip of Twitter files for probably years, probably at least right up to the 2024 presidential election, if not after that. This is not going to be over anytime soon. And you can see that it's already getting less and less attention. I mean, there's an argument to be made to just make it all public so it can be crowdsourced. Online sleuths can go through it. We can all go through it. But the counter argument would be the private information contained in the documents. Not everybody there is guilty or bad, and you don't want to dox them. Here's what Berenson revealed that he learned from the, his first dive into the Twitter files. Every time I say his name, I think of the Mandela effect and the Berenstein Bears, or whichever one it is. Here's what we learned. A Pfizer executive board member, who was also a former commissioner of the FDA, appears to have pressured Twitter into suppressing a tweet that had the potential to hurt Pfizer's vaccine sales. That's the gist of these Twitter files. A former federal government employee who now sits on the executive board of a very powerful corporation saw a tweet that could undermine his company's ability to exploit money out of the American people and profit for themselves. So he did what people like that do. And he attempted to use his power to intervene. That Pfizer executive board member and former FDA head is Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who Pfizer paid $365,000 to in 2021, which that same year Pfizer made almost half of its $81 billion in sales off of the sale of its mRNA vaccine. So you can see why they're very protective of their precious little jabby jab, and they don't want anybody talking any trash about it. Maybe convincing people they don't need it. The tweet in question, which was ultimately tagged with a misleading label by Twitter, minimizing its exposure, was from Dr. Brett Jarwar. I'm probably mispronouncing that. I'm going to call him Dr. Brett. 
Dr. Brett was also a former commissioner of the FDA, and he was a member of the Coronavirus Task Force during the Trump administration as well. But nevertheless, despite those credentials, Gottlieb did not like his tweet, which said this. It's now clear the hashtag COVID-19 natural immunity is superior to hashtag vaccine immunity by a lot. There's no science just there's no science justification for hashtag vax proof if a person had a prior infection. CDC director and POTUS must follow the science. If no previous infection, question mark, get vaccinated. And then there's the misleading label. It says misleading. Learn why health officials recommend a vaccine for most people. And then it says this tweet can't be replied to, shared, or liked. So you can see how that's a message that Pfizer might not like, especially coming from a former head of the FDA. So why not get the former head of the FDA on your own team to step in and do something as Gottlieb did on August 27th, 2021. Gottlieb emailed this guy named Todd O'Boyle, who is a top lobbyist in Twitter's Washington office and who was also Twitter's point of contact with the White House, which means Gottlieb could very well have had previously dealt with him when Gottlieb was working for the government as head of the FDA. And you can tell in the email that this isn't the first time they've emailed back and forth. It's like picking up in the middle of a conversation when you see what, when you read the email. He puts Dr. Brett's entire tweet that I just read you in the subject line, which is a little obnoxious. And then within the email, he says this. This is the kind of stuff that's corrosive, Here he draws a sweeping conclusion of a single retrospective study in Israel that hasn't been peer-reviewed, but this tweet will end up going viral and driving the news coverage. And he's probably also thinking driving down Pfizer's mRNA profits. But that's all the email said. You can tell that's like he had been explaining to this guy before. Here's all the things that don't need to be said and why, and that are going to cause problems. And here is an example of the bad type of tweet that we need to get rid of. Then through something called JARA, J-R-I-A, an internal system Twitter used for managing complaints, O'Boyle forwarded Gottlieb's email to the Twitter strategic response team, which was the group responsible for handling concerns from the company's most important employees and users, And he said, please see this report from former FDA commissioner. Not mentioning Gottlieb's or his company's potential financial interest in the matter. Not that those people who were working at Twitter couldn't put two and two together themselves, really. The strategic response team or analyst quickly found that the tweet in question did not violate any of Twitter's misinformation rules. However, the tweet was tagged anyway and remains tagged even though several large studies have he says, confirmed the truth of Dr. Brett's words. Even the mainstream has changed their position on natural immunity. So they were suppressing information that could have helped people, made people who got the vaccine, some of which might have had bad side effects, decide not to get it for their own personal profit. At least that's what it seems like to me. Hard not to come to that conclusion. I'm sure they would say public health safety Something interesting here, and it might just be a time zone thing. You see there on screen, this email was sent from Gottlieb to Boyle, August 27th, 2021 at 10 p.m. And then when you scroll down and you see this tweet from Dr. Brett and you see the misleading label already applied to it, the date and time at the bottom of that tweet is August 27th, 2021, 9.49 p.m. Like I said, it could be a time zone thing, one of them being East Coast time, the other being Pacific time. I don't know. Either way, it's obvious by that email that Gottlieb and this guy have been emailing back and forth that they regularly have conversations about who should be suppressed on Twitter. I mean, he didn't even ask a question in that email. He just stated his complaint, his grievance, and the other guy just knew what to do, it seems like. So they had a understood way of behaving, it would seem. And that's really it to me. I mean, that's pretty much the main takeaway of the latest Twitter files. Former government employee who had power sitting on a board of a wealthy company exploits that power of both the government, government ties, power from the corporation, 
that's pushing vaccines on everybody, preventing the American people from seeing information they needed that could have helped them, which caused to some people taking a vaccine they otherwise might not have, which result in, resulted in some of them being harmed, done for what appears to be the personal profit of the actor involved, as well as the company he was representing. Just a perfect description of people in power, I think, is what that is. It's good proof of that, though. That's good. Berenson also goes on to talk about how, while all that was going on, Gottlieb was also pressing Twitter to act against him as well. I think that, I guess that was right around the time he was suspended. And that Gottlieb's actions were part of a larger conspiracy that included the Biden White House and Andrew Slavitt, which is Biden's White House senior advisor for the COVID response, working publicly and privately to pressure Twitter until it had no choice but ban Berenson. Gottlieb responded to this claim that Berenson made. He made this in an article, I think, back towards the end of the year, and also again here during these Twitter files. And here is what Gottlieb said. So on Tucker Carlson last night, uh, New York Times reporter, former New York Times reporter Alec Berenson said you got him kicked off of Twitter. Uh, this is a kind of a convoluted conspiracy theory that somehow you told... Look how smug Gottlieb is. ...told Twitter to get rid of him because he was asking too many questions about the efficacy and safety of the COVID vaccine. Do you just want to respond to that and tell us your side? Yeah, look, I'm not going to comment directly on that. And, and he's threatening litigation, too. For no, so another reason not to respond. I've raised concerns around social media broadly, and I've done it on these networks, around the threats that were being made on these um, on these platforms and the inability of these platforms to police direct threats, physical threats about people. Um, that's my concerns around social media and what's going on in that ecosystem. So it wasn't as much about... Oh, wait, that's his concern. What about the physical problems that happens to people who take a vaccine and they have a negative response because people like him, for, the, for what appears to be profit, suppresses information that might have changed people's decision about what they did? And you know what? I, I had COVID. I had three vaccines. I, I, I think without the vaccine, the, those were one of the great scientific discoveries of our... And I've seen all the... I still see it. I said, it does this, it does that. We didn't know this. We didn't do that. That's the way that it, it, for me, it was basically like a mild cold because I think of, of the vaccine. So I'm not questioning that. So you were. No. Listen to him stammer over that question. The CNBC anchor here. He's had COVID and he's been vaccinated three times. And he thinks that COVID, the COVID vaccine is one of the greatest discoveries of mankind. Like a hundred years from now, people are going to be telling their grandchildren of the great vaccine. A vaccine so great that those who took it three times were lucky enough to only get the COVID once. I mean, this guy is terrified of asking this question the wrong way. You know, like, he, like he's afraid of maybe all of a sudden coming down with a bad case of myocarditis and dropping dead right there live on CNBC. You know, and Gottlieb would be happy to chime in and finish the segment. It's a tragedy. What happened, okay? To a man I consider to be my friend. It was tragic. It wasn't a surprise. Everybody heard what he said. He'd only taken the vaccine three times. Three times! That's a dead man walking right there. You think you can walk around in this society, breathe in this air, and live if you've only taken the Pfizer vaccine three times? That's a delusional person right there. You know, I don't know what happened to his brain. But I suspect he fell down a right-wing anti-vaxxer rabbit hole on Twitter. Okay? And that's why these people need to be removed and exterminated. And this message has been brought to you by FISA. That's how Gottlieb comes off to me. He's like a mob henchman who doesn't realize how expendable he is. I, I think without the vaccine, the, those were one of the great scientific discoveries of our... And I've seen all the... I still see it. I said, it does this, it does that. We didn't know this, we didn't do that. That's... The way that it, it, for me, it was basically like a mild cold because I think of, of the vaccine. So I'm not questioning that. So you were, no, you were I'm talking. Un you I'm unconcerned about debate. What's that? I'm unconcerned about debate. I'm unconcerned about debate taking place in platforms. About I am very concerned yeah. when threats. I'm very concerned when threats are and being made, physical threats Anthony against Fauci. people's safety. This had to do with I'm Anthony very Fauci. concerned about physical threats being made against people's safety and the people who gin up those threats against individuals. Okay. That concerns me.
How about some specific examples? That guy is a piece of trash. Just looking at him, his smugness, his attitude. He thinks he's better than everybody else. He's unconcerned with debate. He's unconcerned with negative side effects that might happen to people. Highly concerned with Pfizer's bottom line. I'd be willing to bet on that. That's it. That's the latest Twitter drop. Unless there was another one that happened while I was recording this, which is possible. Because you almost don't even hear about them anymore. But I think that there is an opportunity here with the, the Twitter files. I, I was thinking about it. It's easy to look at them as just a limited hangout. Well, yeah, stuff we already knew. That's what I've been saying a lot of. Just you know, validating evidence of what we already knew. It almost feels like the powers that be, whatever you want to call them, are saying, hey, you crazy conspiracy theorist, you were right. The whole time you were right. Your friends thought you were crazy. People didn't believe you. Well, some people did, but most people didn't. Here is evidence proving you were correct. Let's see if you can do anything with it. It feels like they think that we can't do anything with the validating evidence that they are giving us. And so that is the opportunity that I see in it. How can we use this information to communicate to people who we believe might be able to kind of see things a little bit differently if they just received the information a little bit of a different way? Because that was always the challenge. You know, we get engulfed in the conspiracy idea and the theories and whatnot. We get all of this information. Then we come into contact with friends of ours or whoever— and we end up in a conversation where we're talking about subjects like this, conspiratorial subjects. And when we present what we believe, we don't readily have all of that information that we've been engulfed in available to just, you know, regurgitate onto them in a way that they would be open to it and accept it. That's the challenge for me. So I'm no longer writing off the Twitter files as just placating us. I'm seeing it as them believing that we are too stupid to figure out how to use what they're giving us. And let's figure out how to use it. I have a few ideas. I'll talk about them in another show. Okay, one more quick story about what I thought was a funny joke that Eddie Murphy told at the Golden Globes, that the Golden Globes completely ruined, in my opinion. But before I play that for you, I want to tell you about what we're going to talk about in the DMBXR, which is the strange story of the Herschel Walker staffer who claims to have been fondled for an extended period of time by a major Republican lobbyist. Really strange story. The DMB XR is the subscriber only portion of the show. If you want to get access to that, you can go to patreon.com slash propaganda report and subscribe there. What you will get along with the subscriber only portion of the show is you will get this show, the DNB ad free. I take out all the ads for subscribers and I put it together with the Subscriber only XR, and it goes into a private RSS feed that you can pop into just about any podcast player. Check that out, patreon.com slash propaganda report. You can also check out the website at propagandafight.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at Freedom Act Radio. Okay, so the Golden Globes obviously suck, and more and more people each year are not watching it because they don't care. It's just a bunch of people who are in woke movies getting together to have a grand Circle J. And Americans just aren't really interested in that. But Eddie Murphy last night did liven things up a little bit. He won a career achievement award and he gave his speech and then he, his acceptance speech, and then he closed out the speech by telling a joke. What I thought was a good joke that the television producers of the show decided that they were going to really kind of ruin. I mean, they didn't all the way ruin it. It's still funny. You can tell what he said, but they censored the effing punchline and not in the right way. They didn't like do it you know, tight and quick. It was too long of a sensor, and it dampens what would have been or what was. You can tell. People were laughing at it. A good joke, and I can't find the uncensored version of this joke anywhere. Here's the clip. I'm going to wrap it up and just say something to all the new up-and-coming dreamers and artists that are in the room tonight. I want to let you know that there is a, a definitive blueprint that you can follow to achieve success, prosperity, longevity, and peace of mind. It's a blueprint, and I followed it my whole career. It's very simple. It's three things. You just do these three things. 
pay your taxes, <laughs> mind your business, and keep Will Smith's wife's name out your <laughs> mouth. That's it. Funny joke. Pay your taxes. Yeah, yeah. That was a reference to Wesley Snipe, I believe. But the joke was solid. Good setup. Good punchline. Rule of three. Used it well. Except the only problem is the producers had to bleep the best part of the joke. Not just during the Golden Globes, but I can't find an uncensored version of this joke anywhere. It's censored everywhere. Unless I'm just looking in the wrong places. I mean, and that ticks me off. I want to hear this joke in its natural form, and I can't. Eddie Murphy saying the F word was not the most offensive part of the Golden Globes. The, excuse my language, giant circle jerk was. If they wanted to really protect us from the vulgarity that was on display, they would have censored the entire show, bleeped the whole effing thing. And what's weird about it is that there was a post-show show, a post-circle jerk, circle jerk, if you will. And during it, Murphy was standing at a podium taking questions. And during his answers, he says the F word like five times, uncensored, for all of us to hear. We can hear, it, we can hear him say then, but we can't hear him say it during the punchline of his joke. It's just really irritating. You know what's offensive? This outfit. Whatever this pinkish, purple, like, part men's suit, part wedding dress combination is, this is what's offensive. What does this guy think that he is? Like, part man, part horse? I mean, this looks like something that a gender-fluid centaur would wear. It's one piece of fabric. It's like a tuxedo jacket at the top that doesn't stop at the waist. It just keeps going all the way down to the ground, and it flails out behind him at the hips like a wedding dress would. Yeah, yeah, it's like a one-piece men's suit with the train of a wedding dress attached to it that's obnoxiously trailing along behind him on the ground. Or, excuse me, behind they. This guy's obviously a they. And he's wearing, they is wearing, a matching bow tie. I have no idea who this person is, who they is. This thing is apparently called a tuxedo gown, and it is the stupidest outfit that I have ever seen in my life. Except for maybe this one which is worn by, I think that is one of the characters from House of Dragon. And she appears to be wearing a long black skirt with what looks like a top that is the largest men's dress coat on the planet. That's the combination she's going with here. Like it swallows her up. And with that, she's also wearing what looks like bright purple latex gloves with matching bright purple dyed hair as well as bright purple eyeliner and what appears to be an intentionally smeared purple tear streaming down her face. She looks like an 80s Batman villain that's transitioning. This is offensive, not the F word from Eddie Murphy. And this is far more toxic to children and young people that might be watching than hearing an F-bomb dropped, which apparently it's okay if Will Smith says it, then they can hear it. And what's even more offensive is that you know they paid thousands of dollars for that trash. Censor that. All right, that's where we're going to wrap up the show today. We're going to continue the conversation in the DMB XR for subscribers. Patreon.com slash Propaganda Report. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Have a fantastic rest of your day.